So welcome to the third of Tell Them's SC Sex Ed Community Forums. Uh, my name is Emmy Crawford. I am the online advocacy coordinator. Uh, Tell Them is an e-advocacy network made up of more than 12,000 South Carolina voters who support responsible reproductive health policies. We are a program of the New Morning Foundation, a South Carolina-based nonprofit working to decrease unintended pregnancies in women under 30 and reduce the spread of STIs, including HIV, here in South Carolina. Um, before we get started, we would like to extend a special welcome to Senator Hutto um, from Orangeburg County. So, Senator, thank you for being with us here tonight. Uh, tonight's event is sponsored by Tell Them, New Morning Foundation, Flock and Rally, Soda City Farmers Market, and the Shop Tart. Uh, I want you to please help me welcome our moderator this evening, Dr. Heather Brandt. Um, Dr. Brandt is an assistant professor of health promotion, education, and behavior at the Arnold School of Public Health at the University of South Carolina. She is one of the state's top researchers on issues concerning HPV and cervical cancer. And I think she's responsible for filling half the room tonight, too. So, uh, Dr. Heather Brandt, thank you. Good evening and welcome. It's so nice to see so many people interested in this very important issue that we're facing here in our state and to take this opportunity to listen to these panelists and learn more about this issue at this time. So to start, I'm going to provide some brief introductions of each of our panelists. You can learn a lot more about them if you take a look at your program, so I'm not going to read from that. Uh, the first panelist over there is uh, Dr. Baron Holmes. Dr. Holmes is the Director of Planning and Evaluation at South Carolina Kids Count for the South Carolina Budget and Control Board. Our next panelist is Tamika Isaac Devine. She is a Columbia City Councilwoman, and she's also the mother of two young girls, age seven and age two, so an issue that's very important to her personally as well. And last is Forrest Alton. Forrest is the Chief Executive Officer of the South Carolina Campaign to Prevent Teen Pregnancy. And I want to take a moment to remind all of you in the audience, as well as those of you watching via live stream, to use the hashtag SC Sex Ed Prob to submit a question for our panelists. So the questions that we take tonight are going to be coming to us through Twitter and handed to me by the Tell Them staff. All right, so let's get started. By serving as a panelist for this forum, each of you understands the importance of sex education. So I want to ask each of you to take about three minutes to answer the following question based on your view of this issue. And we'll start with you, Dr. Holmes. Why do you think school-based sex education is important? In particular, you talk about sex education. Yes, okay. the question, why do you think school-based sex education is important? Well, obviously, uh, bringing children into the world is one of the most important things that you do uh, and doing it in a planned fashion uh, in such a way that you'll be in a position to raise them to to grow up to be great people uh, is an obligation that, er that everybody should should hold to and in the culture that we live in today in, in a media world where sex and violence in the electronic world. We're manipulated to do a whole lot of things that in the past uh, children would not be given those same enticements. I'm 68. Um, there was no television in my family's house until I was 11. I doubt there are much of any kids around that, that don't have an electronic world until the age of 11. And so today, as a parent or as a community, you have to compete with that virtual world that are encouraging kids to do a whole lot of things and sexuality and, and, and violence and, and other forms of consumption are 
uh, so, uh, something as a society we have to work a lot harder at and having good legislation to provide direction for our efforts is, is essential, whereas before it really could be done more easily on a family and community basis. Okay, thank you. How about you, Tamika? Why do you think school-based sex education is important? Well, I think school-based sex education is very important um, for many reasons, but I'd start off first by, if you look at the, the course of the day and the waking hours, a child spends more of their time in school than they do with their family um, or any other extracurricular activities. And so it really is an opportunity for us to really get them um, and, and educate them in a proper way in, in a controlled setting. As Dr. Holmes talked about, there's so many other things um, in the virtual world um, that compete for their attention. But during those hours, you have their undivided attention and you have an opportunity to really get, to the, to get them at the core. Um, another reason, I think, is because at, in a school setting, you have trained educators. You have people um, who would be able to answer questions appropriately, um, be able to give the appropriate information, and really counter information that you're hearing in, in other venues. And so I think that school-based education certainly um, is not the only way, but I think it's probably the most important way for us to, to get to our children and give them the proper education in order for them to make informed decisions. All right, Forrest, how about you? Well, I think that Barron and Tamika both did a really nice job, <clears throat> excuse me, teeing up this issue. I would add a couple things to what they said. First of all, one of the things to remember here is that at the end of the day, in this conversation about preventing teen pregnancy and preventing sexually transmitted diseases, at the end of the day, this is about young people making better decisions. Uh, and we sometimes get down in the weeds of, you know, well, is it environment or home or school or this or that? At the end of the day, it's about young people and their decision making. And in order for young people to make better decisions, we have to make sure that they have access to the knowledge and skills that they need to make better decisions. So that leads us to the question, what's the best delivery mechanism to get that knowledge to young people? And as Tamika and Barron both mentioned, you know, we have a captive audience of young people in South Carolina public schools. Uh, and this makes really good sense to be delivering this type of uh, life skill and this type of life knowledge to young people, just like we want them to know about math and history and English. Uh, this is another topic that they need a strong knowledge and skill base. Uh, you know, the other thing I would say uh, to that is, is to remember that sex education is absolutely essential. Uh, and it's absolutely essential, picking up on something Tamika said, because we don't have a choice anymore if young people are going to hear about these topics. You know, maybe when Barron was growing up, we had a choice. Uh, we might have had a choice to say, hey, if we don't talk about it, maybe he won't know about it. Uh, we're not living in that world anymore. No, no offense, Barry. Cool. Um, th that's not the world that our children are growing up in anymore. Believe me, and, and you know this, they're going to hear about sex, whether it's from Chris Brown or whether it's from one of their friends in the cafeteria or whether it's from uh, you know, somebody else on the internet. They're going to get this information. We don't have an option anymore to decide whether or not we should be talking to kids about sex we still do have an option as to who the messenger is. And why not make that messenger a caring and well-trained adult? All right, thank you. And now let's take this one step further and really think about school-based sex education in our state, in South Carolina. So I'll start with you again, Baron. What are your thoughts about the current state of school-based sex education in South Carolina? Well, if we go back in time, I'm, I'm looking at Bambi out there in the audience. Uh, I, 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 in the middle 80s, I came back to Columbia after I was president of Deaf and Blind School in Spartanburg, and just they just passed the Comprehensive Health Education Act. And one of the first things Sarah Shepter, I was the budget director, except the budget office doesn't direct anything. Just want to <laughs> set that straight. Uh, and Sarah Sheptrine sent in her shock troops to tell me that we were going to put extra money in to implement the Health Education Act. Um, 
all the way from the beginning, uh, the, there were weaknesses apparent, and we're still talking about the same weaknesses. So uh, to state the obvious, um, a, an intervention like that that is framed around knowledge uh, and should be framed more about skills uh, requires a very well trained uh, workforce, namely the teachers who, who teach comprehensive health education. And that workforce is not appropriately trained to do that job. I'm just as about, at the same time right now, I'm working on how kids learn how to read. The average teachers only had two reading courses and one math course. That's grossly inadequate. And so if you take the most, in, the most critical things that, that kids need to succeed in life, like being able to read, to maintain their health, and to make responsible decisions to bring children in the world when they can do right by them, we'd be lucky if we graded C, C minus on, on, on what, the way we're performing now. So that needs, that needs to be changed and the support system for that, all the way from whatever courses they take in the universities to the little bit of professional development that the Department of Ed and others can provide, needs to be increased enormously, and the quality of it all needs to be improved. Sounds like you think training is an important element of this conversation in our state right now. Yeah, I think we would all agree that that, that that's the, the essential centerpiece, and if you add the other things but you don't change the training of the workforce, we're not going to get where we want to go. How about you, Tamika? What are your thoughts about the current state of school-based sex education in South Carolina? Um, well, I agree with Barron. I think that training is, is key. Um, you have um, teachers who admit, they would admit that they don't get the proper training in order to teach this subject to children. So I think that that is um, a huge thing that needs to be addressed. Um, additionally, I would say um, the reporting of what is being taught. Um, you can have a child at one school being taught something and a child at another school being taught something. And then just as we know, the children as they talk and one heard one thing and one heard another thing, they're gonna make up something in the middle. <laughs> um, so I, I don't feel like we have the consistency um, and what's being taught and, and we know what is being taught. And then I, I would probably just say lastly, just updating um, you know, what is being taught. Um, times have changed and I think we've all talked about that before um, and we need to stay on top of that and, and change with the times. If we don't want other people teaching our children then we need to dictate what is taught and, and it's, not, it's not being updated in, in 20 years you have to understand how many things have changed, um, how um, that education that they get needs to change with it. So more on the training piece of things and making sure information is updated seems to be an important issue in our state right now. How about you, Forrest? Well, I had three points to make initially, and Baron and Tamika have covered all of them, but I, I feel like in a- Well, then a, can we go on? And <laughs> not, not so fast. Uh, <laughs> I feel like in an event like this, repetition's probably a good thing. Uh, so let me come at this from a little different angle here and first say we should celebrate in South Carolina uh, as a first step some of the things that we're doing right. Uh, and simply the fact that our state does have a comprehensive health education act, and I acknowledge it's 25 years old and needs to improve a little bit. But simply the fact that our state does have an act that requires sex education be taught in South Carolina public schools puts us ahead of some other states. Uh, this is not just a blanket thing that we should assume that every other state is doing this right. Now, that being said, there are several places where our existing law could and should be improved. And I'll mention three of those specifically. Like I said, some of them uh, have, have been talked about already. The first is around medical accuracy. Uh, and I think at a minimum, we would all expect that the information that's being delivered in a school-based setting around sex ed is accurate. Uh, I don't think that's really too much to ask for. I don't think it's much of a stretch. We, 
We want what's being taught in science and English and history to be accurate and up to date and factual. We should require the same of our sex education materials. So that's number one, is, is that the material is, is medically accurate. The second thing I would point to is, is some function of accountability that could be a little bit stronger. Uh, right, wrong, or indifferent, I think it's also a reasonable expectation that we know and have a clear sense and understanding of what's happening in our school's classrooms. Uh, and whether that means a reporting mechanism to the Department of Education or you know, any number of other ways potentially to increase the accountability, we should know whether or not uh, school ABC is teaching sex ed, what they're teaching, who's teaching it, and how it's being received. I think that's a very reasonable expectation. N to be fair, there are a lot of people in local communities working very hard to do their best around this issue. It's a very tri tricky topic. It's difficult to implement. I mean, you know, raise your hand if you want to volunteer to go teach sex ed to a room full of 15-year-old boys. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, this is, this is not something that everybody signs up for, but we should have some function of accountability to be able to know who's teaching what. And, and that leads me to the third point, which I'll go through very quickly, is to reemphasize Barron and Tamika's emphasis on teacher training. Right? The who in this conversation, the who is very, very important. Now, I get stuck in a business and end up spending a lot of time at the State House, and Senator Hutto can attest to this, we spend an awful lot of time talking about the what. What is being taught? What is the content? What is being taught? I can't remember a time, Senator, that we've been standing on the floor discussing the who. Meaning, who is teaching this information? How well have they been trained? And how well are we following up on that training? I think we've uh, put the emphasis on the wrong syllable here when we're, when we're really focusing so much time on the what and spending no time at all on the who is actually delivering this information. All right, thank you. You all raised a number of very important points. I like that Forrest pointed out sometimes we get caught in a cycle of making disparaging remarks about things that happen in our state, but in this case we should take pause to celebrate some things that are going right, but also reflect on things that we can improve on um, over time. So just a reminder to those of you watching via live stream and those of you in the audience, we're taking questions via Twitter using the hashtag SC Sex Ed Prob. And we have a question uh, that someone has submitted by Twitter that I'll put out to the panel. Uh, this is a, a question asking What is age appropriate in terms of sex education? Can you provide an example? Would one of you like to handle that? Do we turn to the mother of the group? <laughs> uh, I'll take a shot at this uh, out of the gate here. What's important to remember, and those of you who are in the audience or watching elsewhere who are parents, uh, often will come up to me after an event like this and say, yeah, I heard you, thanks for the comments, but my daughter is X years old, or my son is X years old, please tell me what do I say to them, please help me. Uh, you know, or somebody will say something like, oh, thank goodness I have very young kids and don't have to worry about this yet. Or the one that chokes me up the worst, oh, thank goodness I have a son and I don't need to deal with this issue, right? <laughs> I mean, all of those things make the hair on my arm stand up. Here's the point. There is an age-appropriate message for young people around sex education at every point in the lifespan. Now, obviously, what we're talking to a five-year-old about is not what we're talking to a 17-year-old about. Those messages are very, very different, but equally as important. And I, I think the question also asks for some examples. If we're talking about young children, we might be talking about good touch, bad touch, about family values, that mom and dad love you. Uh, you know, this is why mom can give you a hug and a kiss on the cheek, but this person over here should not do that. Those messages increase in sophistication over time such that by the time we're talking to our teenage children and we're having more serious conversations about sexual activity and those tricky topics, you know, trust me when I tell you, if the first time that you've talked to your child about sex is when he or she is 16, it's going to be as awkward and uncomfortable for them as it is for you. Uh, so these conversations need to start early and they need to happen often. Thank you. Would you guys like to add anything to um, that? I would echo that and just add a, 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 a brief story. 
Um, my seven-year-old, about a month or so ago, I can't even exactly remember um, what it was, but she made a comment about um, something she heard in aftercare. And it was a slang term for um, a body part. And then, so then she proceeded to then ask us questions. And, you know, I'm an intelligent person, but I wasn't ready for that conversation with my seven-year-old. Um, but I should have been. Um, and, and so the point is that at every age, again, there's so much information coming at them from so many areas. Um, we have to be ready. And so as, as Forrest said, I think at every age, um, there is age appropriateness. You have to understand which, which age is appropriate. And I'm not going to have certain conversations with the seven-year-old, but I'd rather have those conversations with her than her hearing other kids in aftercare having those conversations. Good point to add. Um, Baron. we've been getting a number of questions on Twitter related to teacher training. So I'm going to read off a couple of those questions and ask you to respond to these. Um, first off, is there a training curriculum that you have found that could be recommended in South Carolina? Uh, how can we ensure that they are trained, teachers meaning, and feel comfortable discussing issues uh, like sex with students? And then lastly, how are we going to pay for that? Any thoughts? Mr. Budget Director. <laughs> I'm going to share the fun here with Forrest. He, uh, the, the first thing that, that I want to say is that the university part of the training, the university system is there. And one of the things that we have not done in most of the fields that I work in you know, I, I do young children, early childhood, all the way up through young adulthood, and this is true in, in all of them, is we don't have a close enough relationship between service workers, be they teachers or psychologists or whatever, and university people to agree on what the preparation is that people need. Now, that's not true in every field of work, but that's, that's true in, in the ones I spend a lot of time with. And that that training is already there. A lot of it is not uh, is not adequate and appropriate for what the workers need out in the field. And then, secondly, there's not enough of it, and that's a, that's a separate question. Um, in the course, of, the long course of my career, the, the the growth of the knowledge base on any topic that you want to know about is so huge compared to the paltry amount that anybody knew about that stuff back then that, that part of the, our underachievement is, is just simply people ignoring knowing what's known about what you could do that would be effective. And, that, and, and therefore, getting the people who are going to be doing the work to be exposed to that knowledge base is by, the, by far the most important thing. In terms of curricula, I mean, I'd certainly defer to Forrest on that. The only thing that I'd say is that it's not like one curriculum for anything. There, there are many curricula, and you have to understand the basic concepts that, that underlie the curriculum, and many curricula packages are, are oversimplified, and, and they're presented to people as if they were sort of meant to color by the numbers and just follow the curriculum. It's meant to be in relationship to the people that you're training, what they know, and they ought to take a very active part in that. And that, that would certainly change um, how you would approach using any curriculum. Forrest? Thanks, Baron. Uh, <clears throat> you know, we could spend several forums talking about just this issue. Uh, I'm going to back into it a little bit and, and describe kind of what's happening on the ground here, right? I mean, there, there are a couple different issues at play. One is how do we train the existing cadre of people responsible for teaching this subject? The second question is how do we improve that cadre of people on the front end? Uh, and what we're left with in South Carolina is uh, staff at the Department of Education and staff at organizations like mine at the South Carolina Campaign to Prevent Teen Pregnancy who are responsible at some level for training 
whoever a district selects to teach this topic. And so that might be the football coach, it might be the gym teacher, it might be whoever showed up late to the staff meeting, it might be whoever didn't make the staff meeting and drew the short straw here. So we've got a room full of people that we're trying to train on a very difficult topic that frankly may not be interested in teaching the topic. Right? That's challenge number one uh, and, and the real big issue here. And envision instead a scenario where as Barron described, we were capitalizing on the existing university system and infrastructure in our state and had a mechanism where certified teachers, certified health teachers could be put into schools and put into classrooms, not just to talk about this topic, but to talk about health more globally and, and in general. That's an entirely different scenario. The, the system we have in place now, which is select whoever you can and then figure out a way to train them, is not very efficient, it's not very effective, and it's, it's not very cost effective either. Uh, this is, again, like so many issues we could talk about in our state, an, an example where if we could make an investment on the front end and change the system just a little bit, there would be huge returns on the back end. You just, to say what, just say one obvious thing. This, often the training is decentralized to the point that people who have very little expertise are the people who are providing training to the people that they're, that they're supervising. And, and when, when you're in that kind of situation, uh, you're really just throwing away the whole knowledge base about, you know, the whole field, but also about practices, and you're turning it over to people who are not capable of providing that guidance, and you have a, an entire electronic world that can communicate that stuff. It could be decentralized, but you have to, you have, to have the people who can present it the best uh, much more in, involved, and so, excuse me. You raised some good points, and I think it's important to point out that this challenge of making sure that what we know is effectively delivered to those who will ultimately be providing that information in the schools is not unique to this issue. It's certainly something we uh, see across different health-related topics and, and other fields. So, now what about the last part that was a little bit trickier? Uh, you know, we have a lot of competing demands on our uh, available resources in our state. So how are we going to um, pay for this additional training? What are your thoughts about that? Well, I have one simple answer on the thing. There's a lot of debate now about health care, um, uh, reproductive health education, sex education is nested within comprehensive health education. And it does not take a genius to figure out that if you want to economize on future health care expenditures, educating current generations of kids to, to adopt a lot healthier practices is essential because what we're doing now is going to be unaffordable. I mean, th there's no question about that. And health education is, is like the foundation that you build it upon. There are certain essential concepts about, about wellness, uh, about do you, are you really trying to 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 do right by your own body that that later on have huge consequences and the failure to do that when kids are young and, and adolescents is going to guarantee that with our ability to figure incredible things that medical marvels can do to your body at very high cost is is going to kill our you know our ability to pay for anything else so talking about making that investment up front so Absolutely. that we are uh, more upstream so that we don't face those downstream challenges on our system. Um, just a reminder to please keep tweeting those questions. We're getting a number of great questions to hashtag SC sex ed problem. And in just a few moments, we are going to be opening up the, uh, for questions to those of you who are present, there's a microphone lay, uh, located up here in the, the front of the room. Um, Tamika, you mentioned this earlier and I want to come back to it, this idea about your role as a parent in providing this information to your daughters. Uh, where's that line between what you as a parent will be providing and your expectations of what your children will learn in school? 
when it comes to sex education? Well, um, I mean, I think that there's a distinct line in that I mentioned I, I wasn't ready for that conversation, nor am I trained, as we've talked about here, um, to have that conversation. Um, although I try and, and, and help them with you know, math and other things, I know as they get older, <laughs> I'm going to be challenged in some of those things as well. And I'm going <laughs> yes, I know. So what, um, I will look to the teachers to, to provide that trained expertise and then where I need to be reinforcing what is taught in the classroom, then I will do that. So I mean, I think that that's kind of where my expectations lie. I'm not a teacher. I leave that up to the experts. Um, but as the parent, I know ultimately I have to reinforce what is learned in the classroom, whether it's science, math, sex education, whatever, um, and I, I'm prepared to do that. Um, but I think the other thing is understanding, um, when you talked about the expectation, I remember um, when I was in high school, and it was actually right after um, the bill passed, and there was an opportunity for, um, we watched a video. I mean, that's kind of what they showed us when I was in high school. You watched a video and you're, you're, you, ha and you had to, your parents had to sign off for you to be able to see the video. And if, if they didn't, then those children had to go sit in another study hall or something and, and not watch the video. Um, you know, but it, it was interesting because a lot of parents expected that that video would be the end all be all and that was nothing else. I think as parents and as a community, we have to understand that where our role is, is making sure that we reinforce the positive information um, and accurate information and then make sure that there are resources in the community um, to help support what the schools are doing. And sort of as a follow-up question that just came in through Twitter while you were up here sharing your view as a parent, uh, should schools have programs to teach parents how to talk to their kids as a supplement to what is taught in schools? I mean, I think that would be an excellent idea. I mean, again, you know, as a parent, you, you have your little box that you operate in and understanding what the children are learning and understanding how you can reinforce those, those educational materials is, is very important. But even just how to deal with it, like I mentioned the, the situation with me, I, I was kind of clueless. I mean, it was shocking at first, and then my husband and I are kind of looking at each other like, you know, who's going to take that question? <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. Kind of like being and, on a panel. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, I think that having that um, would have better prepared us for that situation. Oh, I, just one quick thing. Um, I can remember when my, my stepson uh, was at E.L. Wright and they had the open house. And so I, I, I had worked before uh, when we did the Education Finance Act, we put the school improvement councils in there. We sort of naively believed that that would engage parents in the process. Such was not the case. I think that if, just using this as one example, but a very good one, if at the beginning of school they provided some, a training opportunity for people to come and present the kind of data that I've worked on about at what age, what percentage of the kids engage in what risk behaviors, and then told them what training courses and opportunities for discussion and collaboration were to be available then you could engage a lot more parents to come in because they would remember to say, oh, God, um, I went to a Rotary Club meeting one time and this woman was talking about uh, her son and another kid had been doing huffing. Well, obviously, that was the last thing that she would ever have dreamed that would have happened in her family. But we have that kind of data. We know what, you know, at what age initiation starts to take place. But as far as I know, we do nothing to let the parents know what might be coming. And so at middle school, you have these little kids who are, by and large, mostly fairly compliant. And they get to middle school, and it all starts, a lot of it starts changing then. And it's our fault that we're not being proactive to inform them of what's to come, and then to back it up with the opportunity for discussions and training and, and in, information. I'm sorry to interrupt. Go ahead, Forrest. Forrest. Do you have a point to add? Let me just add? jump in on this parent thing real quick. With 
certainly no disrespect to my good friend Tamika. I've had the opportunity to travel the country and have these conversations with varying audiences. Invariably, if we're in a room full of parents, they respond exactly the way Tamika just did, yeah. which is, boy, I really hope they're talking about this in school. <laughs> uh, if we get a room full of teachers together, then they say, uh, they should be getting this at home. This, is, this isn't my gig. You, you see the scenario we've created. Now, invariably, over the next few months, while this issue is being talked about at the State House, you're going to hear somebody say, oh, you're just trying to trump parents and take over their responsibility. While at the same time, we've got parents saying, please help me. Please help me. Now, envision the scenario that's, that's kind of building here. Uh, and instead, envision a scenario where schools and parents were working together and delivering some consistent messages at home and in the classroom that were medically accurate and age appropriate and reinforced both at home and in school and maybe, yes, even having some training for parents that schools provided. I mean, just see the difference in those two scenarios and where we are and where we could be. Thank you. And just a reminder to those of you here with us tonight, we are going to take some questions from the audience. So if you're interested in asking a question, please just come up to the microphone and I'll make sure I check over that way every now and then. Uh, we're getting a number of questions via Twitter about the Comprehensive Health Education Act. Um, some points related to uh, seems like everything that's being proposed by you, the panelists, uh, isn't going to be able to be implemented. And perhaps the CHIA is a bit restrictive, the Comprehensive Health Education Act is a bit restrictive, so how can we address sex education despite the Comprehensive Health Education Act? Uh, we're also getting a question about a parent-teacher organization president who has discussed the school district has actively utilized the Comprehensive Health Education Act as a gag order, um, the pending changes to it that are currently being considered right now. So what are your thoughts about uh, the Comprehensive Health Education Act and the, the role of it? We've heard that there are some things to be celebrated about it, the fact that we have one and that it does require sex ed. Anyone want to take right. that one? Oh, thanks, Baron. That's so kind of you. Fighting allow, over that allow question. Me to take that one. Uh, you know, let's understand a little bit uh, about the lay of the land here. I think this is important. Our state does have one Comprehensive Health Education Act, one document that governs and directs what can and can't be taught in South Carolina public schools. That one document has 86 different interpretations by each of the superintendents and school boards all across the state. Even here in Richland County, I promise you, we've got two different interpretations of what that one piece of paper says. Uh, based on that school board, based on that superintendent. That's problem number one. Uh, the, the other issue that we have here is that, that sex ed is an issue that, that makes us all freeze a little bit. And when we freeze, our default response is to do nothing. Right? I mean, and if I'm a superintendent and, and, you know, we work with superintendents all across the state to provide assistance and help get over this barrier and this inertia, but I get it. If I'm a superintendent, the easiest thing for me to do is nothing. Because I promise you, if I do nothing, as things stand right now, I'm not going to get in trouble. If we talk about this issue at all, who knows how it might spiral out of control and something might happen that leads us to the front page of the newspaper. I don't want that. And so if I have any hesitation about this issue at all, my default response is to do nothing. Now, part of our challenge is one, yes, to strengthen the Comprehensive Health Education Act, but also two, and I, I wanna be real clear about this, the, the second thing, which is equally as important, is make sure that we're ensuring correct implementation of the existing act, right? I mean, I think we need to start there. Let's make sure that we're implementing the existing act as written. Let's also remember that there are some things we can and indeed should be improving and, and do work legislatively and otherwise to make the act even stronger. All right, thank you. Baron or Tamika, do either of you have anything to add before we take some questions from the audience here tonight? 
Well, the first, in terms of the, the act, it was written 25 years ago, you know? And we've mentioned before, it, it, it addressed topics. It, 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 there, are, there are all sorts of things in contemporary knowledge about, about how to promote sexual responsibility and, and health that ought to be in that act. And I would think if you got any reasonable group, any group of people that are well informed about it, uh, which I'm doing right now on reading, you know, we just took it under ourselves. There's nothing in the code to speak of about how you promote children learning how to read. So I outlined what the systemic components are, a comprehensive list of systemic components. And then we took what people in research and practice said the most important things were to do, and then we just started writing them up. And so I, I, I think uh, <laughs> Senator Hutto would agree, when you're in the State House, I, I was on the receiving end, I was the one person budget staff for, for three years in the General Assembly, and it's wide open over there. You know, anybody can come in and propose something. So I, I just say to, to, to everybody, well, shame on us if we don't come in there and develop that that most sophisticated set of suggestions, and then they're very skillful about ignoring what they want to ignore, and then eventually de democracy uh, rules, and hopefully for the good, but if you don't offer it to them, they're, they're not going to respond to it. So the place to start is get some well-informed people and, and continue to do work on writing a lot more good perspective. I'll just use one example. Uh, I testified in the Abbeville case, my pilgrimage to Manning, and while I, was, while I was working on that, I wanted to know what was the capacity of the, of the school districts to implement the education, basically our education standards. Half of the districts had under 4,000 pupils, okay? If you've worked in, with schools for a long period of time and you see the people riding in to the drive-in meetings, gosh, you, you, have, you have some people you see all the time because they're about the only person in those little district offices available to go to a meeting in Columbia. Other places around the country have multi-district uh, support. Uh, they call them Border Cooperative Education Service, BOCES. Uh, we do, we do not make it possible for the little districts to do their stuff well unless we provide them some way that they have professional staff to represent their interest. And if you decentralize it down to a place where there's nobody to work on it, don't be surprised if they don't come up with anything very ingenious sometimes. Well, thank you. Um, let's go ahead and take a question from our audience here. As a high schooler, I often encounter a lot of sexual ignorance because of our lack of education. And there's a stigma with male condoms that if you have one, you're too eager or you're being promiscuous. How do you plan or think have a plan to tackle that negative stigma with the male condom? All right, excellent question. This whole idea that teaching kids about sex or carrying condoms, as the specific example goes, is a, just a permission slip for them to engage in that type of activity. Baron? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm just a retired bull from the past. <laughs> uh, let, let's, uh, let's look at a, this from a couple different angles. The, the, the term sexual ignorance I, is fantastic. I think we're, we're, we're all guilty of it. We're especially guilty of it probably now in the hallways of our, our schools as we're talking about improving the Comprehensive Sex Education Act. And the example you just gave about, well, if a, a guy has a condom, that means he's looking to have sex you know, is somewhat analogous to conversations we hear at the State House that say, well, if you teach kids about sex, they're all just going to want to run out and do it, right? Each of those points have some serious flaws. Uh, and again, where, where we're headed here is, is hopefully in a direction where we can all agree that young people need the knowledge, skills, and resources, insert male condom, insert any number of other things, knowledge, skills, and resources that they need 
to be able to make good informed decisions. Uh, you, you know, I can't speak anymore on behalf of all the high school boys out there. Um, but what I do know from, from research is that most often when adolescents and young people do engage in sexual activity, it's an event that was unexpected and unplanned. Uh, subsequently, more often than not, young people end up not using contraception. Uh, and later on, when we say to them, why didn't you use a condom? They say, well, uh, I didn't know I was going to have sex. I didn't have one. Or why aren't you on birth control? I didn't, I didn't have any intention of having sex. Now, I'm, I'm not talking about contraceptive dispensing at, at schools. I mean, that, that's not where we're going here. However, I think we do need to acknowledge the reality that young people who do make the conscious decision to be sexually active need to have access to age-appropriate medical resources. And that includes, obviously, contraception. So it's wonderful to have a high school student among us tonight to ask us that in question. That is obviously something she's facing in her current school. Ted, do you have a question? Yes, my name is uh, Ted Walker, and I'm uh, a retired elementary school principal and a retired uh, teacher of sex education to fifth grade boys at my school. <laughs> you can imagine how raucous and hilarious that was. Uh, but I. I want to address tonight what I think has been the elephant in the room, which nobody has spoken about. I think the fundamental problem in a state like South Carolina, in a country like ours, is not training or things like that. It's how the religious right has hijacked this issue uh, of sex education in our schools. Hijacked it to the point well, we can't even call it sex education, right? It's called reproductive education, like sex is a dirty word. So in South Carolina, I think what we have is we have a faith-based sex education program, not a hygiene, scientific-based uh, sex education program. The, the problem you know, the, the goal of a sex education program should be that when people have sex, they should be uh, able to have that with the knowledge not to become pregnant or not to contract a sexual transmitted disease. That should be the goal of a sexual education program, which is not the goal of the program in South Carolina. The problem with the curriculum is not what is taught, is what cannot be taught. When I was teaching my fifth grade boys, I couldn't talk about homosexuality, I couldn't talk about contraception, I couldn't talk about safe sex. Those things were not allowed to be spoken. So we are approaching this topic more like 12th century medieval Christian Europe or Saudi Arabian is Islamic uh, Islamism. We are not approaching this scientifically. And what, what always has, has uh, kind of uh, befuddled me is that we don't speak out in this way. We've learned from the civil rights movement, from the gay and lesbian movement, that you don't make progress by just shuffling your feet and kind of tiptoeing around this. You confront these issues. And I don't see the public health community in South Carolina in fronting this great obstacle. Well, thank, thank you. Well, thank, thank you, Ted. Thank you. Um, I, I do want. Um, I do want to follow up on Ted's remarks uh, regarding religion. Uh, we actually do find support. Uh, for people who, from people who think of themselves as very religious for comprehensive sex education in our state. So perhaps it's more a matter of ideology versus one specific religion as compared to another. Um, for example, uh, among Catholics or Protestants, you may find folks who are incredibly supportive of that type of information. So I think it's important to think about how ideology comes into play as compared to religious uh, 
uh, affiliations. Do any of you want to comment uh, in response to what Ted shared with well, us? I was just going to add um, to, I find like on the city level about any issues, um, most of the time when we have something that people are really very vocal about, after I talk to folks, usually it's the vocal minority. Uh, the majority of the folks usually feel some differently, but either it's not impacting them so much so they feel the need to contact their elected official, um, or they feel like, well, you know, more people feel like I do, so I don't have to get out there and, and communicate because other people will be doing that for me. Um, I think that you'll find that there are a lot of people who feel like we need reform, um, but it hasn't gotten to generate it to the point where they're, they're motivated to action. That's one thing why I'm, I'm so proud of, of Tell Them and being a, a part of this movement because it, it's using grassroots to get people educated and then motivated to action. Um, what I think is that we need more of that um, mm -hmm. because I do think that um, you, you have people who are very rationally minded people who may disagree on certain issues, but they do agree that we need reform um, and do agree that the time of teaching abstinence only is, is not effective. Um, and we can't, we can't have that kind of education if it's going to be effective education. So, but I think that we've got to get people more motivated to action and communicate with their legislators. You raise a really important point, Tamika, one that we're going to be reinforcing in the closing. Um, there's a, a number of people watching via live stream and also people here tonight. And certainly contacting your legislator if you're interested in this topic and letting him or her know your feelings is an important piece of, of advocacy and addressing some of the challenges that have been discussed. And so you can do that actually through the Tell Them website at tellthem.org or the reformsexed.org website. Uh, there's access to be able to link you to your legislator to send him or her uh, your feelings about this issue. Dr. Gaddis? First of all, I want to uh, thank, tell them for having this forum. I was sharing with someone that uh, I feel like an old person right now. <laughs> You're um, never old, Bambi. Well, <laughs> old in the context of uh, having the opportunity to be part of comprehensive school health from 1988. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I had a couple of comments, but two, uh, several questions. One, um, that, you know, I've noticed there's been, since 1995, you know, with all the accolades from 1988 up until that point, as of 1995, there was a very strategic intention to dismantle what gains we had made in comprehensive school health. And so everything has really gone downhill up to that point. Um, the, the conversation around 750 minutes of, of content prior to graduation from high school is, is baffling that a young person with all the, that they're bombarded with should con go out into the world, into the college world and into the world as an adult with 750 minutes of guaranteed education. So here's my two questions. Um, when I look at the national aid strategy that President Obama has put out, if you look at all of the partnerships that are reflected and what he has forecast as what we should be doing to address this issue, not just from a health perspective, but all the other uh, departments from the federal level, one of the agencies that's missing from that formulary is the Department of Education. And I've been always wondering where are they and what happened that with the rate of HIV among 18 to 24 year olders where many contracted during their teen years, how is it that the Department of Education is absent in that national dialogue? So my first question is where does our current South Carolina Department of Education administration sit in their positioning around comprehensive school health, specifically sexuality education? Do they support it? Uh, do they uh, 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 promote the ideology of uh, inclusion uh, in their um, decision making? The second is, 
Um, we, we read daily about uh, these new and thriving criminal cases that are coming about as a result of internet access. Um, uh, we have, unfortunately, teachers that are overstepping their boundaries with students and all of that being said. In Comprehensive School Health, it says very clearly that we are supposed to be providing instruction to students in the content around criminal sexual conduct that it includes sexual assault, but it also includes teaching young people what is the law in this state around what is appropriate and not appropriate. And I'm guessing that a lot of the incarceration that's going on with a lot of young people around sexual activity is directly related to the fact that they've never received that education. So I'm wondering from a teacher per training perspective, are they doing that? Are they providing that instruction? And if so, why not? Thank you, Bambi. Um, so her first question was related to the current position of the Department of Education here in South Carolina. And the second question focusing on whether or not the training of teachers and then subsequently what get deli gets delivered to students uh, is really covering some of these important issues, especially related to sexual assault and appropriate relationships. So we can start with the first one if um, anyone wants to. We don't have a representative from the State Department of Education, I should note, on the panel. So would any of you like to, to comment on your knowledge about the Department of Ed right now? No. Okay. <laughs> uh, let, let's see here. I, I, I think it, it is fair to, to understand that none of us are here representing the Department of Education of the current administration. Um, you know, Superintendent Zace is on the record or in the state newspaper at least a week or so ago saying that one of the things he certainly supports around any changes to the Comprehensive Health Education Act would be increasing the accountability piece. Um, you know, he has mentioned that. There hasn't really been a lot of talk from the senior level staff in the administration either for or against the existing Comprehensive Health Education Act. I mean, again, it's a law, it's on the books, it's not something that necessarily an administration comes in and either changes or doesn't. The law has existed for 25 years through a number of different administrations. Now, the question is, uh, is the existing administration or will future administrations be willing to redirect resources, uh, redirect staff time, put energy into you know, compliance, enforcement, teacher training, those type things. We certainly haven't seen any evidence of that yet, but to Barron's point from, from a little while ago, I think it's up to all of us to, to, to push that envelope and ask for those things and make somebody say no. Right, I mean, right now there's, there's really no record here on this conversation, partially because the questions haven't been asked in, in that type of way. And, and, you know, some of this goes back to uh, Ted's points that he raised earlier, very good points, and, and Bambi, your points and questions as well. You know, we've got very, very good polling data in South Carolina among parents, among registered voters, among, you know, all sectors of the community from upstate, Midlands, low country, religion, race, uh, demographics, uh, and, and consistently people tell us four or five things. Number one, an overwhelming majority, 84% actually, support comprehensive sex education being taught in schools. And that includes information on abstinence and contraception. Now sadly, as Tamika pointed out, what we have is 16% of the public that becomes a very vocal minority on this issue, so we're misled into thinking there's some big controversy about this, when really there's not. I mean, anytime we can get 84% of people in a room to support anything, we should charge ahead and go. So our, our key here is not how do we get people to support sex ed, they already do. The question is how do we get people to be vocal about that support? Not only do they support comprehensive sex ed, they support more time, increasing the 750 minute requirement. They support starting these conversations earlier, at earlier grades. They support covering a variety of topics like teen pregnancy prevention, HIV prevention, sexual assault, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on and on and on. And they support teacher training. The, the general public and the voting public in our state support all of these things. It's time to turn that support into a vocal majority as opposed to a silent majority 
and, and really move some of these issues through and, and put some people on the record as to say, do you or do you not support this and what is your administration going to do to make it better? I, th I think that's a very appropriate question. All right, thank you. Um, just a reminder, we are still taking questions via Twitter, so it's hashtag SCSexEdProb if you have a question for our panelists. We received some earlier before we took some questions from the audience, and these questions in general relate about the preparation of teachers who are teaching sex ed in schools. And this gets at the heart of a number of issues that have been raised by those asking questions as well as our panelists. And so what are your thoughts about specifically the level of training, minimum requirements, whether or not there should be certification involved in this process? Baron, do you want to take that one? <laughs> uh, seriously, the we're talking about sex education. Because it's controversial, then it deserves at least a full course. I mean, there's nobody that should be teaching it that didn't have one course, and it ought to be a darn good course, and they ought to have to face the music by talking to people who didn't agree with what they think because mm -hmm. when they go in the classroom, basically they're going to talk about what they think. <laughs> P.E., <laughs> yeah. Yes, and P.E. probably is not very good training to, to, to deal with all of these questions, though some might look on it as, as basically an athletic sport. Uh, <laughs> But, Editorial remarks by Barron. <laughs> right. But, but I, w I would say back from before that on each of these questions we're talking about now, I, I, I don't want to gloss this over, so Heather, maybe you can bring us back to this. You know, there's a bill, 3435, in front of the General Assembly to, to update the Comprehensive Health Education Act. You don't need to wait to find out what the Department of Ed thinks. If you, if you have, you can find one of, 400, of 170 elected officials in the State House to put in an amendment on the thing, then you're going to, it, it will get a reaction because when I'm in meetings and, and uh, Jay, Jay Ragley represents Dr. Zace over there, he's very forthright in telling you what they, what they think. And so, if the thing's not raised, we have only ourselves to, we have only ourselves to blame. So um, this is a very opportune time, and I, I don't want us to to leave here tonight thinking that there's no way to be heard. If there were no bill over there that was currently being considered, that'd be a different matter. But but shame on us if whatever you're concerned about isn't brought to their attention, and you should write it up in the form of whatever amendment you think ought to be made to the bill. Let me say one thing about the, the teacher question specifically here. Um, he, you know, I, I want to be careful because I'm, I work at an agency that prides itself on our ability to teach and train people to cover this topic. At the same time, it's very, very difficult to teach and train people to cover this topic, especially if we haven't selected the right people to begin with. And so, you know, I want to pull this conversation back from what should we be training the existing teachers in to how do we select better and, and more properly trained teachers, whether that's a certification or otherwise, to begin with. Uh, and how do we make sure that people who are in classrooms educating our young people about sex ed have an interest in that topic or at, at least an interest in health in general just like the people we put in classrooms to teach them math have an interest in that topic or in history or in insert topic. We seem to do that across the board until we get to sex ed and then it's a you know, straw poll event here to say who can teach this. At what point do we say enough of that, let's increase our certification programs and training programs on the front end and get the right people in the classroom? 
All right, thank you. We have just a few moments uh, left here in our time together tonight, and I want to give each of the panelists about a minute to sort of sum up any final words that they have related to this issue. And Tamika, we'll start with you. I started off with a very general question about why do you think school-based sex education is important? And we've raised a number of critical points tonight during our discussion. So do you have any final parting thoughts about the, the topic, school-based sex education in South Carolina? Um, I guess my final comments are, I think we all agree that it's not where it needs to be and there needs to be some changes. I think your presence in this room, your presence watching this um, is step one. There's a lot more that we need to do. And so my final thoughts is understand that we all have a role to play, whether you're, um, you know, work with teen pregnancy prevention, whether you are an educator, whether you're a nurse, whether you're a parent, whether you're a community leader, we all have a role to play. And so I would encourage all of us to um, educate ourselves about the issue, what changes need to be made, communicate with our elected officials on all levels. Um, locally, um, school boards, very important, um, state house, and, and our, our um, Congress people because they're, there's some things that need to happen there as well. But we need to educate ourselves, communicate with them, and really motivate ourselves to action because, mm -hmm. as Ted talked about, that's the way change is made. And unless we become the vocal majority, um, it's just going to continue to linger. Thank you. Baron, do you have some final comments? Um, the, the things that people disagree upon, they're not just fought in you know, in the agency buildings in Columbia or in the State House, they're fought in classrooms, schools, communities. And so I would encourage us to go back to my notion of the open house. Um, by engaging parents to understand what the perils are and to come to terms with that and to talk to each other in an environment that can be set up to be informative and respectful of each other, then you have a group of people that when somebody raises uh, a, a contention that, that some teacher teaching the course who may not, as Alton and I have said repeatedly here, not well have, have been as well trained as, as the state ought to provide them to be, then, then it would be easier for the thing to not spiral out of control. But, but over and over again, we, we expect parents and families to be able to do things when we haven't done anything to enable them to do that. So I offer my humble little suggestion, go to your next open house and the choir will sing and the PTA person will say that there are only 40 bucks left in the till and they've got to raise some more money. But look to see whether the things that matter the most, whether it's in education, you know, in their courses, or the kind of stuff that I've worked on about risk behaviors of which, about sexual issues are, are just one of a, of a number. We are letting the parents down by not engaging them and informing them about what may happen. And they're not going to support us if they don't know what they ought to know. All right, thank you, Baron. How about you, Forrest? Any final thoughts? We've covered a lot of ground in a, in a pretty short period of time tonight, and, and a lot of the conversation has, has centered around how do we make things better. Uh, and that's an appropriate frame for this conversation. And, and all of the ideas we've talked about, whether that's improving the medical accuracy of the content, improving the accountability, improving teacher training, all these things are, are very, very important. But I also want to leave us with a thought that kind of builds on something that Barron just said, which, which is let's not forget that in our efforts to improve the infrastructure, we also need to spend just a little bit of time supporting the existing infrastructure and understand how difficult of a topic and difficult of a subject this is for schools to, to take on. So when somebody in your school district, whether it's a teacher or a principal or a superintendent, is doing a good job or doing what the law says or, or really exemplary in this issue, 
give them a call too and say thank you and say we've got your back and it's okay and we're glad that you're doing this in our district. Uh, you know, those kind of things go a long way. So while we uh, zero in here, and, and again, it's an appropriate place to focus on improving the infrastructure, let us not forget to support the infrastructure as it currently exists. All right, thank you. Uh, well, it's come to that time in the evening where we're going to be uh, wrapping everything up. So let's uh, take a moment to thank our panelists for their participation tonight. And I also want us to take a moment to, ta to thank Tell Them for organizing this forum and having these conversations. And lastly, I hope that if you're not already acting in this area, that your participation in the forum tonight, whether you're watching through live stream or you're here with us, has motivated you to act. And there are a number of steps that you can take uh, to get involved with this issue. And Forrest uh, very adeptly pointed out, if you like how things are going or the way something's working, say thank you. But when it comes to this issue and others, if you feel that there's something that needs to be done, do something. And you can visit the webpage of tellthem.org or reformsexed.org. Send your legislator an email through those links. Uh, give them a phone call. Let them know how you're feeling, what you're thinking about this particular issue. And for those of you who are here tonight with us, there's more information about these resources at the Tell Them table out near the refreshments, where I know we'll all soon be heading. So one final note, uh, the final forum is going to be held on March 14th in Charleston. This is a, a series that has been organized by Tell Them to have conversations about an issue that can sometimes be uncomfortable but is incredibly important uh, to all of us today and tomorrow. So let's uh, thank everyone once again for your participation and good night. <laughs> <laughs>